Hey there, everybody, and welcome to this presentation on listening without defensiveness. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this presentation, we're very simply going to explore what might cause defensiveness and identify some strategies to enhance assertiveness and reduce defensiveness. So let's start at the beginning. Remember that all behavior has meaning. I know I've said that a bazillion times. I'm going to say it a bazillion more. When people become defensive, it's often a behavior that indicates they don't feel safe for some reason. And it could be they've had prior learning experiences of unsafeness in relationships. They've communicated with somebody who was either verbally or physically aggressive or invalidated their feelings, invalidated their emotional or cognitive boundaries. And they have learned to communicate with others based on that relationship. They've learned to communicate with others in a defensive or aggressive manner. Another reason for defensiveness could simply be discussing triggering material. If you're discussing something that is very close to your heart or very traumatic for you, then you may guard it and you may become very defensive about it. A lot of people become very defensive if somebody criticizes their parenting style, for example, because that is something that is very personal to them and it feels invasive when people criticize it. Defensiveness, as I mentioned, is a type of aggression. When we are defensive, basically what we're saying is, my thoughts and feelings matter, yours don't. And that is pretty much the definition of aggressive communication. So what can we do about it? The first, well, you can do these in any order. First thing I would say is work on enhancing self-esteem. We need to create safety. And one of the main reasons that people become defensive is because they feel that they are being invalidated or they fear they're going to be rejected. By enhancing self-esteem, you are able to recognize your worth as a person even if you make mistakes, even if other people don't like you or agree with you 100% of the time. The next thing is to recognize the difference between criticism of you and criticism of your behaviors. A lot of times people don't like something that you did or the way you handled a situation. It's not that they don't like you, they are criticizing your behaviors. And it's important to separate the two. Just like a child can do something that is wrong and we say, you know, little child, that was a bad choice. We don't say you're a bad child because the child is good, but the child made a bad choice. And that's what we're talking about here. When we are receiving criticism from people, we need to hear, are they saying that they didn't like a behavior that I did or are they being aggressive and saying that they don't like me. Which takes us to take what's useful and leave the rest. Even the best constructive criticism may not be accurate in your perception. So, and, and this is one of those phrases that uh, we say a lot in addiction recovery because everybody's recovery process is a little bit different. So not every tool that I give people, not every observation that I make is useful. Sometimes it's off point. And it's important for be people to be able to take the information, hear it. If it's useful, great, use it. If it's not, let it go and recognize it was just one person's observation. Be realistic. Nobody is liked by everybody. It's just the way it is. There is not a person that I've ever heard of who is liked by everybody. I've even heard criticisms of Mother Teresa and the Pope. So nobody is liked by everybody. And nobody's behavior is going to be liked by everybody all of the time. We make mistakes. We're human. We're fallible. We're going to do things, even if we think we're doing right, we may do things that other people don't agree with. And that's okay. 
they don't have to, as long as we're not violating their rights or hurting them in some way or hurting somebody else. Um, if we are doing what we think is best, then that is something that we've got to sit with. Nurture multiple sources of support. When you are in a discussion with someone, when you have differing points of view with someone, it is less threatening if you get into a discussion with them and, and you disagree, even if you start fearing that they are going to reject you because of it. If you've got other sources of support, if that is your only source of social support, then it's a lot more threatening if you are risking that person abandoning you. If you have other sources of support, family, friends, acquaintances, colleagues, whatever, then that makes it a little less or can make it a little less threatening. It doesn't mean that it won't hurt like heck if that person decides to cut ties and abandon you. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying if you have five fingers and you lose one of them, you can still do most of the things that you used to do. My grandfather lost two of his fingers um, when, when he was in World War II and he learned how to do most of what he needed to do with just three fingers. Um, he relied on those three fingers to help him through. Set and maintain boundaries. And these are all kinds of boundaries, physical boundaries. You know, when we are having a discussion, when we are relating, these are my physical boundaries with regard to touch, etc. Affective and cognitive boundaries. These are my feelings. These are my thoughts. You don't have to agree with them, but they're mine. And I am not going to let you take them from me. I am not going to let you try to you know, invalidate them. And I am not going to let you impose your feelings and thoughts on me. I can recognize and validate your thoughts and feelings as yours. And at the same time, recognizing my thoughts and feelings as mine. And that is really hard to do if you're not used to doing it. Because if we are angry, you know, we want people to understand why we're angry and agree with us, not just validate, I can see that you're angry. So it does take some getting used to, and we'll talk about reprogramming that default mode network at the end of the presentation. Environmental boundaries, not as important when we're talking about, um, preventing defensiveness, but it's always good to feel respected. And when you feel respected by the person you're communicating with, it is less threatening. You feel safer. So environmental boundaries mean this is my stuff. If it's at work, this is my desk. These are my, these are my drawers. You don't go through them. I don't go through yours. Um, if it's at home, you know, whether it's your diary or your whatever, you have things that are yours and your environmental space that you expect people to respect. And relationally, relational boundaries, as I think about them, are who I'm allowed or who I feel comfortable having friendships with. So I may have boundaries. I may have some friends that my significant other doesn't like. And that's okay. You know, he doesn't have to like them, but if they're my friends, I am not, I am going to set the boundary and say, they are still my friends and you don't have to hang out with us. However, I am not going to kick them to the curb just because you don't like them. So physical, affective, cognitive, environmental, and relational boundaries can all be very helpful. But it's important, those people that are in your social support network, you have to feel safe with. You have to feel like you can trust them to be there for you. You have to have, drum roll please, a secure attachment to. They have to be consistent, responsive, attentive, validating, encouraging, and supportive. Give the respect you expect to get. 
when you're talking to somebody, whether it's at work or whether it's in a personal relationship, when you're having a discussion, especially a tension-filled discussion about something, uh, it's important to practice strategies that are assertive, that say, my thoughts, feelings, and needs matter, and your thoughts, feelings, and needs also matter. And let's find a way to compromise. So give the respect you expect to get. If you don't want people to be snippy and defensive with you, then you probably want to try not to be snippy and defensive with them. If you want people to listen and hear you out, then you probably need to listen and hear them out. And we'll talk about some strategies to do that in a second. Try to be empathetic and curious. If you passionately disagree about something, what is informing your decisions about this situation and what's informing their decisions? Maybe you have two different information sources and they may be at opposition. It doesn't mean that one is righter or wronger than another one. It means they are two different points of view. This comes up with politics, religion, healthcare, even things like quality time. You know, what does quality time look like to one partner versus another? What does effective communication look like to one partner versus another? So it's important to be able to be empathetic and curious. Explore alternate explanations, and I usually identify three. Explore three alternate explanations why someone might be critical or short with you today. You know, maybe normally you get along and today they happen to just be really antagonistic. So that may lead you to ask why? What's different today? Or there may be somebody who is regularly antagonistic with you. You feel like they regularly throw you under the bus. Um, and it's important to step back and consider, does it have to do with you? Did you do something to offend that person or make them feel threatened? Or is it their stuff? And maybe you remind them of somebody from their past or remind them of some shortcomings that they have. And so their projection is what they are reacting to, not you, but what you represent to them. Sometimes people will give us feedback that can make us feel like we're being criticized or, and, and put us on the defensive. Now remember, the first thing you want to do is try to separate the criticism of the behavior from the person. Okay, so are they criticizing me as a person or criticizing the way I do something? Okay, that's the first thing because it's less um, threatening if they just don't like the way you do something. It's still not comfortable, it's still not pleasant, but it can be less threatening. But then also consider what where it comes from. Is it well-meaning and intended to be constructive feedback or does it come from a place of um, unhappiness and uh, fear themselves where it's intended to be destructive feedback? Is it intended to cut you down and make you feel bad or is it information that they think somewhere in their mind that it's helpful and they're trying to be accommodating? You know, sometimes we'll have relatives that may come over and give us unsolicited advice and that can feel like criticism or sometimes it comes out as criticism and they intend it to be helpful advice. So it's coming from a place of caring but it may be presented in a way that is less than compassionate. So consider where it came from and pick your battles. Sometimes people are as they are and some people tend to be more, uh, provide more feedback, let's say, uh, provide more feedback than others. And that's just the way they are. It could be the way they were raised. It could be they're coming from a place of unhappiness. There's a lot of reasons that people may be 
engaged in excessive feedback. But it's important to recognize, is getting defensive and getting into a discussion about this or an argument about this going to do any good? Is it going to be beneficial or just a waste of my energy? So play that tape through. I had one family member uh, who used to come over and every time they came over, they would have to say something um, helpful or sometimes it was just all out critical. But once they said that, once they had their say, once they made their observations, they were done with it. And my husband pointed out to me this pattern and said, you know what? Just let them come over, let them say their piece and let it go. Because then once they get it out of their system, everything is fine. Um, and I've seen the same thing to, uh, with another relative we have um, between two other relatives. And they don't discuss it. You know, the, the one relative can be somewhat cantankerous and the other person is just lets it go. Just says, you know what? That's just the way she is. And it's important to recognize when getting into a, an argument or a discussion about something might be futile. Now, that's not to say um, be passive. That's not to say don't have respect for yourself. But it is important to pick your battles and say, is this worth the energy? Evaluate your beliefs about what it means to be wrong to make a mistake or to not be liked. What does that mean? Why are those things threatening or devastating to you? What do they represent? Do they represent rejection? Okay. What does rejection represent? Because most of us, I dare say all of us, but at least most of us have experienced rejection, have experienced failure, and it's never fun. Don't get me wrong. Uh, however, some people can experience rejection and pick themselves up and go, all right, that didn't work. And other people are incapacitated by it. So if you happen to be incapacitated by fear of rejection or very troubled when you fear rejection or feel like somebody's being critical, it's important to examine what you're telling yourself. What does it mean? In the big scheme of things, what does it mean if this person doesn't like the way you clean your house or parent your kids or whatever it is that they're criticizing? Think back and try to identify at least 10 times that you've gotten defensive. I think most of us can do that. For each one, what was it about? Why did you feel threatened? Why did your, your hackles go up, so to speak? Um, was it because it reminded you of the past? You were projecting because this, whatever was going on, the way somebody said it or what they said reminded you of the way your mom, your dad, your ex used to say something. So that triggered that memory so, and triggered that reaction. So you were reacting to something from the past that this person happened to remind you of. Were you reacting because you were mind reading? You assumed that you knew their intention when they said something. You assumed that they were trying to be hurtful, hateful, critical when they may not have been. And you know, God love him, my son, is one of those people who is very analytical. And if I say the sky's blue, he is going to say it's aquamarine. If I say a, a flower's yellow, he will say it is some slightly shade of yellow, different shade of yellow or something. I mean, so it's important to recognize he likes to debate. He likes to look at things his own way. And he has a hard time taking other people's perspectives. And if I'm mind reading and I say something and he immediately contradicts me, which is kind of a daily thing. Um, if I'm mind reading, I might say he's being disrespectful and he's trying to challenge me. 
when in reality, all he's doing is brainstorming other potential explanations for something. Now, is that the best interpersonal skill? Well, no, but he's not meaning, you know, go back to where, where is it coming from? He's not meaning to be malicious. He's just not empathizing at all. And he's talking from his logical mind. Also, look, are there any themes? When you look back over the things that you get defensive about, sometimes there are themes that come up. Maybe it, you get defensive about um, your parenting or um, you get defensive about how you do your job or you get defensive about how you dress. Um, whatever it is, you know, if there are themes, then you want to examine why is this theme so sensitive for me? Why is this such a touchy topic that I tend to get defensive when people bring it up? So what do you do? When you talk to people, and we're going to assume that this applies to, you know, important relationships. So with your family, with your children, well, obviously their family, with your significant others, with your friends, you may need to set ground rules when you get into a discussion or an argument, whatever you want to call it. Um, there are certain things that are fair game and certain things that aren't. Uh, don't mind read. Don't assume you know that what somebody's going to say, which also means don't finish their sentences. Let them actually finish their sentence. You might be surprised that what you thought they were going to say wasn't actually what they were going to say. Stop projecting. And this is way easier said than done. But it's important to really get a handle on it and recognize when you are reacting to somebody because they remind you of something from your past as opposed to reacting to them in the present. My mother, you know, I, our, our caregivers always have little hot buttons that can trigger us later in life. But my mother used to have this look and she would cock her head and put her tongue into the side of her cheek. And I would know every time she would get that look that I was in deep doo-doo. So when people do that, I feel like I am that six-year-old again, getting ready to get yelled at and I can get defensive. It's important for me to recognize those nonverbals as well as, you know, verbals and topics. Um, from my past that may be triggered, that may trigger that inner child, if you will, that reacts like a six or a seven year old instead of a, you know, 47 year old. One person and one thing at a time. When we become defensive, we often want to interrupt. We hear what we think somebody is starting to say, and we want to cut them off and clear it up right away. That's not helpful. So the talker gets to talk and the talker stays on point, talking about one thing at a time, not a whole list of done me wrongs, but talking about whatever one issue they want to discuss right now. Once you resolve that issue, you can move on to the next one if you've got the energy but one issue at a time and that person talks until they said what they need to say. Use objective language when you are talking. Instead of saying you're lazy, say I feel frustrated when I come home and you've been home all day and there are still dishes in the sink and your underwear is in the middle of the floor. Um, I live with teenagers, what can I say? Um, <laughs> But that is objective. If I say you're lazy or your room is a disaster, that's not objective. They may look at their room and go, looks fine to me. So it's important for me to say, when I see, when, when I go into your room and the bed is not made and there is dust an inch thick on every flat surface, that stresses me out. That causes me stress. And I would appreciate it if you would, it would help me feel a lot less stressed if you would make your bed and dust your shelves at least once every two weeks. 
Um, so providing objective statements about what it is that's bothering you. Have a safe word and a de-escalation plan if you feel like you're getting defensive or being attacked. Introverts like to think about something, process it, and then tell you about it. It's just the way they operate. Extroverts like to talk it out. We think while we talk. So it's hard for us to process something unless we're actually talking. So let's just imagine an extrovert and an introvert in an argument. The extrovert wants to talk it out. The introvert gets the input and wants to process it for a minute and then talk it out. Well, that creates a problem. If the introvert wants to leave to go sit down and process the information, the extrovert may feel abandoned or ignored. So it's important that you have a plan in place where if, the, if either party needs to take a minute or 10 minutes to get their thoughts together or to de-escalate, that you have a safe word and you have a plan and you know that, okay, if I say, you know, chocolate cocoa puffs, whatever your safe word is, um, that I am going to go take a break, but I will be back in X minutes, let's say 10 minutes. That lets the extrovert know that they just have to bide their time, hold their peace for 10 minutes, and then you will reconvene. That keeps that person from feeling abandoned and that allows the introvert or the person who needs the time out time to get their bearings, get regrounded and not feel like their um, emotional boundaries are being violated because the extrovert continues to, or the other person continues to pursue them. When you are talking with one another, listen to hear and understand. There's a big difference. And I will refer you to my math classes. When I was in graduate, well, even elementary and high school, um, math, I would hear everything the professor said. You know, no problem. I'm sitting there, I'm listening, I'm taking notes. I am not understanding a lick of what they're saying though. I can repeat it back to them, but I have no clue what I'm saying. I might as well be speaking a foreign language. And a lot of times that's what communication appears to be between people because one person is talking and they're saying something and this person is passing it through their interpretive filter. You know how Google has the Google Translate? Well, it's kind of like that's what people do in real life. You have the receiver taking what the talker is saying and passing it through their own filter and it comes out different. It's not 100% accurate. If you've ever put something into Google Translate, especially if you've put a larger document into Google Translate, it gets things mostly right, but there are some things that are not accurate. And that's really what we're talking about here, is making sure that not only you're hearing what's said, but you're understanding what is meant by what is said. Once you hear and understand, Take a moment to breathe and reflect if you feel your stress level rising. Now it's important to hear, regardless of whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, you're the talker, you're the receiver, whatever. The talker needs to be able to talk until they're finished. They put a period on that final sentence and then there's maybe five seconds or even more of silence. The person who was listening takes a breath validates the other person's experience. I hear that you're feeling frustrated about what's going on, or I hear that you're angry. Um, okay. And then summarizes what they think they heard from the other person. I hear you're frustrated about this. What I hear you are upset about is blah, 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 blah. If the person says exactly, well, great. And then you can move on. If, they, if the person says, no, where'd you get that from? Or you totally missed the point. 
then you want to back up and say, okay, help me understand. But if the person says yes, formulate a response using I statements. I statements work a whole lot better than you statements. When you're saying, I feel this way, or I would like this, or my anxiety gets triggered, that is less antagonistic and that feels less threatening to that person than saying, you did this, you did that. Um, and you can even get it from the, the, the nonverbal gestures, you versus I. The other thing that's important with um, I statements is we are respecting their boundaries. We're saying, I feel like. We're also not saying, you made me. Now, somebody can do something and it can trigger a feeling in you, but what you do with that feeling is up to you. For the most part, and I know in the comments, you'll come back with all kinds of exceptions. I know there are exceptions, but for the most part, when you're talking about two adults, one person can't make another person feel or do something indefinitely. You know, you can reward it, you can conjole it, you can ask for it, but you can't necessarily make anybody do something. They have to want to do it. Um, and, and again, that's especially true when you're talking about adults. When you're talking about children, um, you know, obviously you may have a little bit more pull, but ultimately if little Johnny doesn't want to put away the, the dinner dishes and he sits down in the middle of the kitchen, you know, you may not be able to make him do that. He may prefer to endure a punishment, but I digress. So I statements, you may say something like, I feel like my thoughts or feelings or experiences are being invalidated or trivialized when you say. So if somebody is talking, uh, has talked in the past about their childhood or their traumatic experience and in the present, the other person makes light of it or minimizes it in some way, or it seems to minimize it in some way then that person may come back and say, I feel like my experience of this was invalidated when you said X, Y, Z. The person may say, instead of getting defensive, the person may say, I feel anxious about sharing my thoughts with you because, you know, basically preempting the defensiveness saying, you know, I really don't want to go here right now because I feel anxious about sharing them. I feel like it's going to be a threatening situation for me. And I know that if I get into a situation where I feel anxious, where I feel threatened, I'm more likely to be defensive. So I feel anxious about sharing my thoughts with you because that opens up a dis possibility of a discussion or my anxiety gets triggered when you raise your voice. Now that's still owning it. My anxiety gets triggered. I'm not saying you triggered it. I'm saying my anxiety gets triggered, but it could be because you came from a childhood where when your caregivers or somebody raised their voice, really bad things happened. So currently when people raise their voice, it may make you feel unsafe and defensive, or it may make you feel like that little child that used to get chastised by their parent. Other strategies, find areas of agreement. You may disagree on some aspects of a situation, but you also may agree on other aspects of a situation. You know, how to achieve world peace. People have different ideas about how to do that. And it's important to hear where you've got commonalities and also where you've got differences. You might be able to learn something from other people who have a different point of view. Look for ways to collaborate instead of conflict. If you have an idea about something and somebody else has an idea about something, how can you make them work together? which is a way of creating a win-win. 
Another way of creating a win-win that's not really collaboration is saying something like, you know, I feel very stressed when you're supposed to be at home at five o'clock and I don't hear from you and you know, you don't roll in until eight o'clock. It would really reduce my stress if you would text me if you're going to be running late. You know, that's creating a win-win because it's saying it would make me happy if you do this. And if I'm happy, then I'm less stressed, which is good for you too. Pick your battles. I already said that one. The mnemonic device for this is think. Is what you're saying truthful? Is what you're saying hopeful? Does, you know, or is it something that can be helpful to, to the person or is it irrelevant? You're just being nitpicky to be nitpicky. Are you saying it in a way that's inspirational or are you saying it in a way that's critical and demeaning? You know, when I would talk to my staff, I would talk to them in a, I would try to make it inspirational. I know that we can make this happen. I know that you can achieve this. Let's work together to figure out how to fix this situation instead of saying you really screwed up and you better fix it. You know, <laughs> there's inspirational and there's critical. Is it necessary and is it kind? You know, sometimes we've got to provide necessary feedback that may be helpful and we want to make sure we say it in a way that is not only inspirational, but it's kind. And that really helps diffuse defensiveness. Apologize when necessary. Sometimes we're still going to get defensive. And when we get defensive, it makes the other person or can make the other person feel threatened and may put them on the defensive. So by recognizing when we've been defensive, when we've behaved aggressively and we apologize, we stop it and we apologize, we are helping the other person recognize that they are safe. We are not going to intentionally violate their boundaries. Finally, engage the executive control network. There are three networks that are important in attention. The executive control network is just what it sounds like. The executives, the CEOs, the cognitive area. The salience and emotion network is the network that pays attention to all of the stimuli in the environment. It's just constantly scanning. And the default mode network is the habitual way of doing things. When you drive to work in the morning or, well, let's say you drive to work. A lot of times, if you've driven to work a dozen times before, you probably know what you're doing and you may get in the car and drive to work and not even really think about it. You know where to turn, you know what you're doing. It is automatic. You're on autopilot. You're in default mode. When we are in fight or flee, when we are, that HPA axis is activated. We are in a default mode. We are in a protective mode. We're not thinking, we're just fighting or fleeing to stay safe. So the default mode is opposite the executive control network. When executive control is in, engaged, the default mode is not. When the default mode is engaged, the executive control is not. The amygdala is triggered by a threat and it, when this happens, it strengthens the connections with the default mode network or that fight or flight response, which may result in default habitual responding. So when the amygdala is triggered and the more frequently it's triggered, the stronger its ability to trigger that fight or flight reaction and completely bypass executive control, completely bypass the option for cognitive control, which means people react emotionally. The executive control network helps you focus on the present situation in the current context. You know, we already talked about projection. Well, the executive control network says, okay, yeah, we got all those memories there, but how accurate is that schema? How accurate is what we're expecting based on the current context and in the current situation. And is there a response 
that's more in line with what I really want to do? Is there a better response that I can choose? If I don't want to be defensive, if I don't want to be impulsive, what can I do? The executive control network, the cognitive area, can help you learn new skills and alter schema. So instead of constantly having that amygdala and default control network, that fight or flight network kicking off, uh, the executive control network can help you learn new skills and alter those schema. So instead of seeing yourself as regularly in danger and helpless, you start seeing yourself as empowered and safe in your own skin. This reduces the strength of the amygdala connection with the default mode and reduces HPA axis dysregulation. What can you do to strengthen these connections with the executive control network? Rehearsal is important. Envision yourself in situations. You know, think back to situations in which you've become defensive before. Replay them in your head, but this time play them out using more helpful communication skills. You can also do this with an empty chair. You know, if you envision the person that you got into the disagreement with or you got defensive with sitting in that chair. And again, replay that discussion, but this time figure out how to handle it differently. Figure out what you need to do ahead of time to make sure you feel safe and explore using some of these other tools. The nice thing about cognitive rehearsal and using the empty chair is you can pause whenever you want to and think and process it through and go, okay, I wonder what they were thinking, or I wonder if this, you know, what, this what this might've triggered in them that caused them to become defensive. It's also important for you to identify and modify your outdated schema. So if you are regularly getting defensive and saying things like, you sound just like my dad, mom, ex, whatever, that's probably a schema that you're still projecting onto people. So identify those schema, recognize them, but then also recognize that this person in the present is an entirely different person. It's not your mom, your dad, your ex. It is Sally. And form a schema about Sally. Not about all people in general, but what does Sally mean when she acts this way? What does Sally mean when she says this? And use beta testing with this. And beta testing, all in caps, stands for breathe. First thing is to take a breath, slow breath in for four or so hold for a few seconds, and then slowly exhale. That helps reduce your blood pressure and, and start re-regulating or down-regulating your HPA axis. Evaluate the facts in the situation. You know, really t take a look about the facts in this situation, in this context, at this time. Think about what your options are. And if you have the luxury, talk to other people about what your options are. And then act. So at first, this feels like a cumbersome process. You're used to reacting. But unfortunately, when you react, when you immediately act, a lot of times you are reacting in the default mode. And if you're watching this presentation, you're trying to get out of defensive default mode responding. So it's important to practice some of these skills. Sometimes you can even turn on the television, you know, turn on some um, reality TV show. And sometimes you can find information there to practice paraphrasing or um, practice some of these skills with and think, okay, if I were the person on the receiving end of this conversation, how would I react? Because sometimes, you know, some of those, I remember way back when it started, I watched one of the seasons of Big Brother. And I remember sitting there uh, thinking to myself a couple of times, oh no, you didn't. Oh, you wouldn't talk to me that way. So they weren't even talking to me. And I felt myself getting defensive and triggered. When you feel that way, 
you know, pause the show and go, hey, what's going on here? What just got triggered in me? And why did I feel the need to maybe try to stick up for that person? You know. Defensiveness is a way we protect ourselves from hurt or rejection. It is an aggressive behavior, but it stems from that fight or flight response. Defensiveness, because it's an aggressive strategy, also tends to make the other person feel unsafe and attacked. So defensiveness is often met with, guess what? Defensiveness. Creating safety is essential to reduce defensiveness. Having those ground rules ahead of time, using objective language, using I statements, staying on topic, etc. In real life and cognitive mental rehearsal of new skills using your executive control network is essential to enhance feelings of safety and effectiveness. If you can do it in your mind, you're that much closer to being able to do it in real life. You're strengthening those mental connections so when it comes up in real life, it's easier to pull that tool out of your toolbox. By rehearsing this in your own mind and seeing it come out well, you're also helping to reprogram your self schema of the default mode network. So you're starting to see yourself as capable of protecting yourself as safe and as effective as a communicator.